So how long were you painting and doing this? 35 years. Are you serious? 35 years? I, I mean, how often were you taking stuff? All the time. Right. The addiction got so <laughs> the addiction got so bad, Matthew. And the thing is that when something becomes so easy, and I'm going to tell you, it's all this is all psychological. This is not has nothing to do with whatever you may think it is. This is all psychological game. The 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 planning, what you're going to pick out, the people in the room, who could possibly get blamed besides myself. Because I'm a clean cut guy. You put me up against an Irish guy that I was working with that's drinking all the time and comes in Monday morning. It's obvious. He took it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hey, this is Matt Cox. I am going to be interviewing uh, Picasso. He is an art thief uh, that was tremendously successful, and he did it in a really interesting, unique way. And I'm actually going to be going to the premiere of a movie or a documentary about him. And so let's go ahead and uh, check out the interview. Let's start at the, um, I mean, the beginning. Like, where were you, where were you born? I was uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Sunset Park to be exact. And I mean, how were you raised, you know, middle class, um, lower middle class, upper we middle were, class? We were below poverty level, specifically. Um, my dad wasn't in my life, so it was just my mom. My mom had uh, myself, my little brother, and my two older sisters. So it was, you know, she was on food stamps, but she worked. But, you know, we would wake up sometimes without food in the refrigerator and it was hard. It wasn't easy. Okay. So what did you, so did you graduate high school or did you? I went straight from uh, high school, which was uh, Fort Hamilton High School to uh, Kingsborough Community College. And then I attended uh, business school at York Business School in Manhattan. Okay. What you know, my you? thing was, uh, my thing, uh, Matthew, uh, was that uh, after my father left, I had a really traumatic incident with my father. My father was a, uh, an alcoholic and uh he verbally and physically abused my mother you know so after he left he left when i was six but um at the age of 10 i realized that uh i couldn't let my mother you know struggle alone so i i got a job with the daily news as a paper boy you know i did the hustle i learned really early in my life you know i think most of my education wasn't in school it was on the street so you, but eventually, I mean, eventually you graduated high school. You went on to try and, uh, you wanted to help, help your mom. I'm assuming you wanted to make some money, mm -hmm. um, help her out. Like, uh, what were your, what was your plan to, what were you planning on doing for a living? As a kid, the whole time I went straight through, uh, junior high school and high school and college and even the business school, I took accounting. But then I realized that I couldn't, I have a lot of anxiety. I suffer from severe anxiety. Like you have no idea. So uh, I figured I couldn't do accounting. I can't sit behind a desk doing some numbers. So I got a job as a painter when I was uh, 19. And that was it. I mean, I was on Park Avenue. My first uh, real gig as a professional painter was right on Park Avenue for the 1% of America, the richest, the ultra wealthy of America. Well, when you say a painter, you mean what type of a painter? Just a painting? regular house. You were painting interior. buildings, yeah. commercial, we were painting residential. All residential, all decorative finishes, faux finishes, uh, gold leafing, wood graining, a lot of uh, exotic finishes like marmarino, where we put the uh, the finish on the wall and then we we uh, put some mica stones in it. So that way it shows like diamonds out through your wall. It's just beautiful finishes, all exotic stuff, stuff that comes from Paris. All the finishes that they have in Paris, we uh, duplicate on sample boards. And we do this on some of the highest uh, grossing buildings in Manhattan, you know, 770 Park Avenue, you know, some of the uh, Billy Nays Row, you name it, and we've done it. On, on day one, I walked into Park Avenue. Um, this was a, $250 million apartment, gorgeous apartment. I mean, things in uh, windows from the floor, literally from the floor to the ceiling, you know, 68th floor of 
this building, amazing building. But anyway, there was so much artwork that the artwork was not only hanging on the walls, but it was in boxes. You know, it was right. ready to go to where it was going to go. And at that point, I fell in love. I mean, I've always loved art, but not to that extent. Like, what, it's one thing to see it from a distance in a museum that you can't touch it, you can't feel it. But it literally is something else to be in front of it. It's uh, it's something that'll change your life. I mean, if you if you can understand art, art is not something that you just. You know, it's not a guy with a brush is zigzagging his thing, and you know that's what he did. You know what I'm saying? This is something that someone put a lot of passion and love into. When people follow the artwork, I mean, people follow artwork all around the world for years. You know, there's followers. There's dedicated followers. Right. But uh, on this job, that was it. That was the key. That Once I got to Park Avenue with all that artwork, how do you even resist that? You see, I've always been a criminal. There's just some scales to it. You know what I'm saying? It's always right. been, you know, since I was 10, I've always been a hustler. So by the time I got to 19, forget about it. But you weren't an artist yourself. Like you didn't no. actually, you didn't do art. You just, you just had a passion for it. And now I you're had walking. A passion for it. Right. But now I was walking into, to, um, in with this company that we did specialty finishes. So if you translate the specialty finishes into, let's say, regular paintings, you know, it, it's the same language. There's no difference. What happened? Like, what? At, at, what was the first time that you, you know? Well, I guess what was the f one? What was the first time you actually took something, and what was the plan? Were you thinking, eh, these people have a lot of stuff; they're not going to miss this one thing, or were you thinking I can sell this, or no? No, you see, it was never a monetary thing because artwork, artwork is unlike anything else. Artwork is, no, there's no black market for artwork. If somebody tells you there is, like, right. uh, you know, it's just, you know, I call, you know, I'm not going to call my cousin Louie and say, yo, Louie, what's the number for the black market again? You know, this, that doesn't exist. Yeah, artwork, it, it, I, yeah, it's meant I'm, to be appreciated and it would be an insult just to sell it to some random person it's just that's not what i did it for i did it for the thrill i did it for the ability to see if i can do it and the plan came together on the very first job and it never stopped after that cool so what was the first the job the very first job was the park avenue job and when i saw this particular painting it was a small painting it wasn't that it wasn't this extravagant painting. And I, at the beginning, I didn't know what the value of the painting was either. But I fell in love with the painting, and I decided that that painting was going to go with me. We spent two months on that job, and by the end of those two months, I had already duplicated it. It was a very simple duplication. It wasn't a complicated painting. It was uh, one of those pencil etches. You know, I duplicated it myself by who? color copy. I couldn't tell you that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying because you, you know, like I, it's funny because I know that I, you know Picasso was. So I, I don't know if you know this. I, I I have a degree in fine arts from the. Oh university. no, no, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, from the University of South Florida, which. Um, so uh, I'm actually an artist. Uh, so I, I don't what? know. Yeah, I, I so you I mean, ha watch a couple of the things, but you, you don't mention that you're always into the into the podcast, into the uh, person you're interviewing. So I do that. I do YouTube. I wrote a bunch of books when I was in prison, a bunch of uh, cr uh, true crime books. I wrote a memoir about myself. And then I got out and, you know, I like true crime. So I started also I started doing a podcast when I got out. I didn't think I was actually, you know, I didn't really know how to do any of this, but I just kind of figured it out, you know, had some people help me and, and now it's starting to come together. But in the meantime, I did 
artwork and people buy my artwork. And um, so, yeah, so that's why I was saying like, it's like, so I know, so when, you know, you say Picasso, like Picasso was one of the few artists that was famous during his lifetime. You, you, you know what I mean? Like most artists, mm-hmm. they scraped by, you know, and then they, you know, they passed away and then their, their artwork became worth something later in life. Like there wasn't a lot of artists, you know, Edward Munch was never like, he sold like one painting his whole life. Like, you know, now he's huge. Now, you know, they're, they're huge paintings. And, but Picasso was famous in his lifetime. And mm-hmm. one of the things I know that he did is that I know that there are hundreds of little drawings he did. Like I, like he would be at a, at a restaurant, someone would recognize him and they say, Oh, can I get your, this is, these are the stories I heard. I'm sure you probably know more than I do, but one of the things I had always, we'd always heard was the stories were that like, he'd be at a restaurant and someone would come up to him and say, can I get your app, your autograph? And he'd go, yeah, yeah. Just get, let me finish. And uh, I'll give you an autograph. They go, okay. And then he'd finish up his meal and he would doodle something on a napkin or a piece of paper and sign his name and give it to him, you know? So they get this little thing that was, no, baby, it's just cute. But now they're selling for 35 and 45 and 50 and a hundred thousand dollars for, for little doodles and people have them. So that's why I, when, you know, I, I heard that, you know, your story and I heard that you, you, you know, cause I watched part of it where they, you know, I guess at some point you kind of looked around and you realized like, Nobody's here. Nobody's watching me. There's no cameras. There's all this art. No, that wasn't my thought. No, that was <laughs> that was not my thought process. No, that was the second time I've been there. Yeah, that was the second time I was there. Oh, this was it, this was. I thought you ultimately you did this. You did it. I thought you did it in several different places, though, right? You didn't look around and um, think. Nobody's watching. No, um, uh, this particular, the very last time where I was, um, where the reality show was filmed, um, I had been to this particular mansion out in Kings Point on a prior occasion a few years ago, and everything that went missing on that time, let's just say. At, 10% of it was reported missing and 90% was never reported missing. You know, so when I went back to the house the second time, you see, there's a lot of things that change from first time and second time. And the second time I went back to the house when the house was fully bugged with cameras and the SWAT was there and they were everywhere. I was high. I had smoked two blunts. You know, to, to get to work that morning, I smoked two blunts. I was calm. You know, life was good. You know, I had nothing to worry about. So all the red flags, I avoided the red flags. You know, there was so many red flags. There was a, a red flag that uh, there was a hallway door that I had previously. Remember, I had was in the, in the house before. So there was a hallway door that goes from one side to the other. And that hallway door was locked. And I knew what was on the other side of the door because I already had been on the other side of the door. But I should have abandoned ship at that point. That would have been a red flag. That would have been no go. But I was high. I was calm. You know, I got a little, maybe a little sloppy, you know. And at that point, I felt at home. I was checking my signatures, validating the paintings, and I was taking what I wanted. That was it. Well, th- but this isn't the first time. The fir- This is... No, this further. is the last. Okay, so the first time you take it, you you swap out this piece of artwork. Yeah, because I didn't want to steal it. Right. I didn't want to just plain out steal it. If they see it stolen, it's gone. Yeah. Obviously, if you take that poster behind me, I'll know it's gone. <laughs> right. But if you swap it out, then you don't know anything's going on. Right. And and the and so they didn't notice. They never noticed. And we took, this is over a span of, I believe the apartment took us, it was, this was just an apartment. I believe it took us three months to paint the apartment. Okay. So it was in a span of three months from the planning 
to the execution. That's a lo- that's a long time to paint an apartment. It's you can paint my whole house in a day. Yeah, this is Park Avenue. This yeah. is uh, <laughs> they charge ten thousand dollars a room. You know, right. you know, it's, it's the best of the best. Buried by the U.S. government and ignored by the national media, this is the story they don't want you to know. When Frank Amadeo met with President George W. Bush at the White House to discuss NATO operations in Afghanistan, no one knew that he'd already embezzled nearly $200 million from the federal government, money he intended to use to bankroll his plan to take over the world. From Amadeo's global headquarters in the shadow of Florida's Disney World, with a nearly inexhaustible supply of the Internal Revenue Services Fund, Amadeo acquired multiple businesses, amassing a mega conglomerate. Driven by his delusions of world conquest, he negotiated the purchase of a squadron of American fighter jets and the controlling interest in a former Soviet ICBM factory. He began working to build the largest private militia on the planet, over one million Africans strong. Simultaneously, Amadeo hired an international black ops force to orchestrate a coup in the Congo while plotting to take over several small Eastern European countries. The most disturbing part of it all is, had the US government not thwarted his plans, he might have just pulled it off. It's insanity. The bizarre, true story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. Available now on Amazon and Audible. So three months, you swipe this one piece, and then you go to the next job, and there's artwork there or no? At the next job, it was a vacant job. There was nothing inside the apartment. No, so there was nothing to, uh, it wasn't always, uh, it, was, it wasn't always, uh, it was either hit or miss. You know? Right. But most apartments, 95% of apartments usually had an art collection. And I mean art collection. Right. You know, like uh, 300, 400 pieces at the minimum. That's a collection. Yeah, that's insane. Um, are, and are, are all these, is all this famous artwork or is there, some people are just collectors? No. Some people, uh, that's the thing is you see these people, um, I think you said it best at the very beginning of the show. You said it best that most artists, when they put stuff out, they put it out. Nobody cares. You know, who cares? So these people are just collecting things that they love, they admire, something that they want to decorate the house with, something that would look good in Architectural Digest, because right. we've done that too, Architectural Digest. Uh, we've done a couple of issues of Architectural Digest. So, you know, this is not about investment in artwork. You know, the, art, the artists are blow. Even Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol wasn't famous till the end. All right. Um. Yeah, I was gonna say that uh, there's lots of there's lots of people that are just the rich people that they collected just because it's like oh I like that piece and you know I um, John and Mabel uh, Ringling uh, you know they they collected tons and tons of stuff and stuff they collected wasn't you know, they just collected because they liked like I like this piece I, you know they'd have one piece that was worth you know a hundred thousand dollars next to another piece that you find it practically in a, in a, in a garage sale. You know what I'm saying? That was worth virtually nothing, you know, but in the end, you know, almost everything ended up being, ends up being worth something. But a lot of stuff that they collected, the, the artists weren't even, weren't even well known at the time. And then after their death, the collection became worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so, and I just, I just always wonder if that's how it, how it goes just in general. So, how how long were you painting? You know, were you painting, and so, and over the span of this, these things like if the opportunity arises and there's something you see and you like and you think I can I can work work this out, you 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 took advantage of that situation, correct? And then other times there was just nothing there, like you weren't interested in in yeah. anything, and yeah. I'm not interested because, exactly. like you said, you're not selling it. You can't you can't go. No, I that, a rim the thing was, I was, I was, um, I was supposedly ha- happily married, you know. 
supposedly happily married, you know, great wife, great income, you know, the painting wasn't going to go anywhere and nobody's going to know where I got it from. You know, when I brought it home, I put it on a wall, you know, and nobody knew anything about value in my household. This wasn't some, um, you know, so it just went on a regular wall in a regular house. But, it, you know, I appreciated it. It was always a centerpiece, something I can look at every single day and admire, you know. Um, have really you ever heard of the the Gardner Museum heist? Yes. The one that I believe still is not solved. Yeah, right. Yeah. They, you know, like those paintings, like I always think to myself, like these guys stole a ton of paintings worth a hundred million dollars or 200 million. They can't move. Like you couldn't move those paintings. No. You can't sell those. Like yeah, what? what the right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just assume. I was thinking to myself, like they're probably hanging on somebody's, you know, somebody's in someone's garage, sitting in a garage, or they're hanging on somebody's wall, and they have no idea what's even on on their wall, or they think it's a it's it's a replica. They they probably don't even realize what they have. Uh, so, did you ever come close to getting caught? I got caught only that last time when they did the reality show. And um, that was the thing is, you know, they, if you listen, the name of the reality show is called the Brooklyn DA. And I'm featured in episode number one and three. And uh, if you listen to the detective and you listen to the DA in the reality show, they pretty much tell you if he doesn't take anything, you don't have him on anything. Right. But remember, I was already there. And I just told you that 90% of the stuff was never reported. So, you know, everything's on video. If you, if you go out, you can YouTube it and you can see it. You can hear their comments and all that. But, um, dude, I was coming out of there with something. But the problem was, once I, if I would have just listened to the inside, the spider sense, if I would have listened to that, I wouldn't have got arrested that day either. I still would have been out and about. Your intuition, right? Like I always say that intuition, like you got to listen to your intuition. You got to uh, like, you know, it's funny too, because intuition, like people shrug it off. But the truth is like every chick I've ever dated knew I was che or, or cheated on, knew I was eating before. Like nothing's wrong. They just know. And you're like, nah, you're crazy. You're crazy. And I'm thinking, what? what, what? Everything's fine. I didn't do anything. I came home at the same time. I did everything. How did she? Intuition. She knew. You know, if some girl you're dating, something's not right. Even if she comes home at the same time, everything's right. But you know, you're like, nah, what's something? Something's up. Can't put your finger on it. Your intuition tells you something's wrong. You got to listen to it. I'm, I'm Yo, Matt, when I came out of the mansion, I was in my Mercedes and I stopped at a stop sign. And I look in the rearview mirror and I see a camera crew run across the road <laughs> with a big light and a camera. And I was like, that's odd. That is odd. Um, I was so high. And then SWAT came from everywhere. Dude, they, they executed two search warrants, one in Pennsylvania at my house where my uh, ex-wife was pregnant. Um, and then one at my, uh, at the job site in Kings Point, Long Island at the same exact time within seconds. So th this reality TV show, what they had, tell me about that. I don't know, even know what that is. Uh, the Brooklyn DA is a reality show about cases that was specifically taken on by the Brooklyn district attorney. And it profiles my case as a case, the very prestigious art collection that um, a painter walks into one day and walks out with paintings. And they, sh they show me in, in episode number one and three, and they had the whole mansion rigged. Not only the mansion, they had, the, like I said, the camera crew was running across the street. They had another camera crew in Pennsylvania, you know, for the SWAT team. You know, it was a whole reality show put together and it led to some very strange and eerie circumstances throughout my case that Matt, I could tell you were, were insane. You know what I'm saying? It was just crazy. You're saying reality TV show. I mean, it sounds more like a sting. It like was they, a sting, but it was, it was reality also reality. TV. They were, 
So they knew you had taken something. They thought. They thought. They put. They, they rigged the whole place with cameras. They put it. Put it a situation together that they knew you'd be in the mansion by yourself, and they just hoped you'd yep. take something. Yes. Okay. okay. What did you take? I took a Picasso painting. I took a Devil Fay, and I took one other. I forgot the name of it. But the crazy thing is, two of the paintings were never recovered. And they still let me out. Isn't that weird? Right. Because. Maybe they're hoping know. you would lead them to the paintings. Yeah. Shit, I would love for that one. Yeah. So, <laughs> how long ago? What year was this? This was, uh, we're going to go 10 years ago, uh, 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. Uh, how long? So, how long were you um, were you painting and doing this? Thirty five years. Are you fucking serious? Thirty five years. I, I mean, how often were you taking stuff? All the time. Right. The addiction got so. <laughs> the addiction got so bad, Matthew. And the thing is that when something becomes so easy, that's the thing. Is you know, and I'm going to tell you, it's all. This is all psychological. This is not has nothing to do with. Whatever you may think it is, this is all psychological game. The, the, the planning, what you're going to pick out, the people in the room, who could possibly get blamed besides myself, you know, because I'm a clean cut guy. You put me up against an Irish guy that I was working with that's drinking all the time and comes in Monday morning half drunk. It's obvious. He took it. <laughs> you know <what> I'm saying? <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was gonna say, yeah, you weren't selling them, so it's not like you. It's not like you look like you needed the you needed the money. So, and you're and every are you replacing them with duplicates every time? Yes. Well, uh, there's a, I'm gonna say there's nine times that I can remember that I didn't replace them because I knew that it it, it wasn't gonna be met. You know, it was in a storage area somewhere. When people put things in storage, especially on Park Avenue, Madison Avenue. Storage is yeah. for your skateboard. It's not for a Monet. Right. It's not for a Picasso. It's not for none of that. You know, you shouldn't be putting your devil face inside the storage box in the basement. There's roaches down there. You crazy? <laughs> um, okay, so this has been going on for a, a long time. Eventually, they catch up with you. Um, how many paintings did you have? On me? Well, that they, they call you. I thought you they only they, found the three that were in the car. You know, they only found the three that were in the car. Oh, I thought they they, they didn't do a search, like a go and search your house. Oh yeah, they did. They weren't going to find anything there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I put them in my house? Come on. Well, I would think you would. You said like you wanted to enjoy them. You said you liked them. No, nah, not with this girl. Let me tell you something. Um, my ex-wife. My ex-wife, she, she, she's a ride or die. My ex-wife, she, I was married for a very long time, 21 years, God bless, you know, but then I separated and got hooked up with the mother of my kids. Now, this is the type of girl that she would, we got pulled over one time in Jersey, and I believe I took the charge for, for DUI because I was driving. She wanted me to take the charge for a, a marijuana cigarette in the front of the car. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, she would wrap me out and sell my knee down the fucking river in a second, this one right here. You know, there was no way I would bring anything over there. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. She gets pissed off. She'd be calling me a CI art division. <laughs> um, all right. So. So they grab your stuff. They go to your house. They don't find anything. How how do you end up uh, doing the documentary? Did you write a book? Did you were you approached? How'd you end up with the documentary? This is the deal, Matthew. And I think you're going to find this the most intriguing. You want to know why? Because when I was in Rikers, I went from Rikers to Nassau County Correctional. You know, the, and, and I saw those. To me, everyone's the same person, whether you're a CEO or you're an inmate in a jail, it's the same 
you're all, we're all human. You know, there's, there's no level to human. But uh, a couple of the guys in jail were telling me, hey, you know what? Um, your story is insane. I couldn't wait to see something like that on TV. Um, it captivated dude from Taiwan to whatever, you know, around the globe. During the NBA Final Four, they, in, in, in my jailhouse and Rankers and all throughout my whole tier, OBCC, oh boy, everybody was watching the show, the Brooklyn VA. So I said to myself when I got out and I gave up everything, I gave it up to my two daughters. I have two, uh, two daughters, one is six and one is eight. And, um, I gave up the life of crime for them. I couldn't give it up for any other reason. I enjoyed it too much. So, you know, but, uh, I made an investment in myself. I made a financial investment and I reached out to someone that I believe in, Adrian Mazzone of Transmedia. And uh, I said, uh, I want to do a documentary about my life and I want to confess, you know, I want to confess about everything. And I did. You going to see it because I'm going to see you at the, at the premiere. Yeah. <laughs> so, Okay. <laughs> Um, how long were you locked up? 18 months. 18 months? Yeah. My, my lawyer was Bruce Cutler, John Gotti's lawyer. Okay. Dude, my case is phenomenal, man. If you write novels about it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, yeah. How come you didn't, how come you didn't write a book? You had 18 months. Uh, I was battling my case. I, that wasn't me. You see, for me, writing a book would have meant that would have been, a confession. You can't write a book. Uh, you, you just asked me the first question you asked me. I had to say no to. What's the name of the? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you, there's a way. There's a way to write around that. No, I mean, but you can't answer that. You, that's one of those questions. Listen, Matthew, when they arrested me in Kings Point, this is look at the scene. They arrest me in Kings Point, and you could see it on the on the real on the reality show, the Brooklyn DA. It's phenomenal. But um, in the Picasso of Thieves, you heard the real story. They arrested me, and I was high. So I didn't know why. Why? I, you know, there's three old master paintings in the back of my pen, but why am I getting pulled over? You know what I'm right. saying? I thought maybe there was a mix-up. But uh, they get me down to the station house, station house in Kings Point, and there's this huge giant like tons of anarchy table you know all those giant long tables with all these detectives around it all of them you know chilling back there with their badges like 35 of them 25 of them from all over counties everywhere you know fbi i think was there too and they thought i was coming in crying but i was like they sat there ready for me to bleed out and i was like where's my lawyer and that was the end of that you know what right. I'm saying? I still moved on, you know, and it was just more of a game, dude. It was just a game. You know, I was, uh, I'd go to the DA's office, starving. He'd have a table full of Chinese food for me. It was something out of some, some make believe movie. Like, why? Why for me? And then I realized that it was because of the reality show. So they were trying to get that confession. They knew I hadn't eaten in a week. <laughs> right. All right. So, how long did how long after you got out? How long did it take to put together your, the documentary? Uh, the documentary was just last year. Um, I had some health issues, a lot of health issues, and I uh, have two little girls. And this is not about other people, but this is about them. This is about uh. I want them to know who their father is. I mean, the real person, what hat, what made me who I am and why I am the way I am. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not embarrassed of who I am. I just want people to know, you know, this is me. I mean, I trust me. I, I understand that. Like, you know, it, most, it's funny because most of the guys that I know that were locked up, that were like con men or fraudsters or scammers, like they're in prison trying to figure out like how to get out, change their name, how to keep anybody from knowing what they did, how to start their life over. And I was like the only person who was like, I'm telling everybody what I fucking did. Fuck them. Like, you know, I would say, listen, there's, there's two kinds of people in the world. There are those people that know 
the things that I've done and the person I am today and are 100% accepted of it. And they're those people that can go fuck themselves. And that's it. There's only two. So to me, like, you know, I'm not going to be hiding and lying and dodging the rest of my life. Like, I'm not doing that. Like, this is what I did. And you're either okay with it or you're not. You don't have to be in my life. If you're not, we'll kick rocks. There's lots of people out here. So, yeah. So, I mean, I know exactly what you're saying. Like, I, I'm not going to, you know. I mean, obviously, I would prefer not to go to prison. I could have missed the prison part. I'm okay. I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So you see, I see something. I see something. And I read people. I read people, whether you're, wherever you're from, I could read straight through you. But um, there's something about respect that I see in you. Like you want somebody to disrespect you. Am I right? That what? You want to let somebody disrespect you in jail? That I wouldn't? Wouldn't. Would you get into a fight if somebody... Like if I had to get into a fight, to be honest with you, I would get into a fight if, I, if it came down to it. But let's face it. You know, if I'm not, if this guy's six foot fucking two and he's going to beat the fucking hell out of me or something, eh, that's probably, probably not, I'm not, probably not signing up for that. But luckily, <laughs> you know, <laughs> luckily I, I, I did that, that didn't, you know, I didn't have to run into that issue. Yeah. And listen, once I'd been locked up a few years, like I got into a routine and I was okay and people knew who I was and, you know, I didn't, I never had any problems or anything. I think maybe two times I had an issue with, with a couple with a couple of guys, and it was just because I got a slick mouth. You know, I mouth off to somebody, and and I realized right away, I realized right away that you know either I'm going to say nothing and hold everything in until I'm you know till I leave here, or I'm going to mouth off every once in a while, and I'm going to get punched. Somebody's going to smack me. These are big guys. They're these are these are not nice guys. And I'm not a big guy. I'm like five foot six. So, you know. What? Yeah, I'm tiny. <laughs> but I'm okay with it. So Size doesn't matter. And let me tell you something. I, I, I was telling a friend of mine the other day that when I was inside, there was this dude. He was this huge monster of a man. This guy, and he had, uh, he had mental health issues. But uh, he was just... He went, he got on me like this point, like he was going to bother me. And I knew that if he took me, he was going to beat the fuck out of me. All right. right. He would have dragged me. So I had no commissary money. So I couldn't pay anybody. Right. And I didn't know anybody in there. So that wasn't going to happen. So, you know, what I did is I figured out a plan. The, there was a gang running our house. Right. And he's not in the gang. So there's a, a particular gang running our house. So I played his mind, you know, on them, you know, and I said to them, you know, my sister, she's a hustler. What about if I get my sister into the visiting room to pass you a half ounce of weed and you give me half and you take half? This this was all going, this was all like, check it out. Listen, it was all going like that. So uh, that that happened in the morning. This nitwit got on me by lunchtime, just picking on me. And I knew that, dude, I couldn't take it to the head with this guy because this guy would have fucked me up. He was a nut. So I said to the guy that I was talking to, the head of the, you know, I think his name was Gun something or other. I said, yo, dude, I'm out of this house, bro. This guy's fucking with me, man. How the fuck are we going to do this shit? I'm going to another house, bro. You know what he did? He got together three guys and he put a little bird in this guy's ear. Stop fucking with Picasso. Right. This guy flipped out, flipped out, and he attacked, <laughs> he attacked the CO, the correctional officer. They had to bring the turtles in to beat the fuck out of him and get him out. See, so that's the point is, you know, it's not about size because this guy would have taken me. He would have wrapped my head around the fucking toilet. You know, it's about you. You know, you got to use the. You got to use what you got. You got the brains. You fucking get the bigger guy to beat the fuck out of that guy. You know what I'm saying? That's, there's always a will. There's a way. There's a lot of guys in there with mental health problems. Oh, who do you tell us? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know there were so many. You know, 
I remember one time this guy, <laughs> he came up to me and said, listen, he said, he said, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, yeah, what's up? And he goes, listen, man, he said, I'm taking anger management. And, and, and so, and my first thought was, man, and no conversation has ever been a good conversation that started with, I'm taking anger management. Like I thought this conversation is about to go bad. And, it, and, he, and I was like, okay. And I thought, what, what's happening? What's, and he goes, you've been slamming your door every time you leave the cell. And I, you know, those doors are heavy. So, you know, you, yeah. you go to close them. Like I'm just kind of pushing it. Not that well, I walk out and I kind of close and I know it'll close. But of course I'm 15 feet away by the time it goes, bam. And he's lives in the cell next to me. Now, I didn't know this because I barely paid attention to anything that was going on. I didn't know really anybody in the unit. I went to my cell. I read all the, the first few years. I was in the medium security. And I looked at him and he goes, he goes, man, you slam the door every time you leave the cell. And I looked at him and I go, are you in, are you in this unit? And he goes, man, I'm your, I'm your next door neighbor. I said, I'm in the cell next to you. And I went, did you just get here? He goes, I've been here six months. He goes, you've been, I've been here as long as you. And I went, I'm sorry, bro. I don't even pay attention. I, I, uh, okay. So go ahead. He's like, you know, I'm trying to work on my anger and, 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 and I'm supposed to talk to you before I do something. And I thought, <laughs> well, thank God for anger management. You know, I was like, Ooh. I said, well, listen, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make a valid effort to try and correct that. And I will close the door. You know, he's like, yeah. I, feel, I feel like you're doing it on purpose. I'm like, bro, I don't even know who you are, man. Like I hear you, but I don't even know. I didn't even know you were my, my, my neighbor. But I'm gonna make an effort. <laughs> Listen, I must. I kept slamming that door. Like I would walk away just by accident. And finally, my celly came to me. And said, "This dude's gonna kill you. Do you understand?" And I was like, and I was like, "Fuck! I keep fucking. I can't believe. You know, it's a hard. It's hard. It's a hard habit to break. So, um, yeah. Yeah. But I did stop. I did stop slamming the door. You know, which was stupid. And luckily, I didn't have to get. I'm sure if I'd got my ass beat, I'd have probably figured it out real quick. I'd have probably never oh, slapped that man. door again. But um, yeah, there's some real mental cases in there. And then I taught. Listen, the GED. I taught the SLD GED. So I got the guys that can't even pass the GED. There's like the slow learning d disabled guys that are like, you know, you're trying to teach them like basic math and like they can't count change. And it's like, oh wow, like. This is bad. Like, I'm like, look, you need to know how to count money. And they're like, you know, my bitch count that money. I'm like, yeah, I know. I get it. You, you're going to go back. But, but when you go back out, they're like, I'm going to sell drugs again. I'm like, yeah, but what if she doesn't count it right? Like, what if she counts it wrong? And he's like, I put that pipe. He goes, I put that pipe on and she count that shit right. And I was like, that's probably true. But, you know, like, <laughs> this is that I was that I was not that was not an environment I was really prepared for. So, Dude, yeah. When I went in, when I was in, and we were in the yard at Rikers, and I was walking the the track with this dude, and I'm like, he's like, "What are you in for?" I said, "I'm in here for Archie, you know, for stealing art." And I said, "What are you in here for?" I cut up the corrections officer, and I murdered my wife. And I'll, he went on and on. I was like, oh, shit. Let me get the fuck out of you. <laughs> well, you seem like such a nice guy. Listen, like the guy, <laughs> the guy I hung out with the most in prison is in prison for, for murdering two FBI um, uh, um, you know, cooperate, you know, whatever, CIs. Nicest guy. Damn. Nicest guy. Until you oh. take the honey bun from the commissary. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Like, you know, if you, you borrow something, you want to pay him back. Or you, you know, if it's, he says, get you, a, you know, can you get me a six pack? Of course I can get you a six pack. I'm embarrassed that you had to ask. I don't know why I don't already have the six pack. I'm, you know. <laughs> Pierre Rossini in the 1990s was a 20 something year old Los Angeles based drug trafficker of ecstasy and ice. He and his associates drove luxury European supercars, lived in Beverly Hills penthouses, and dated Playboy models while dodging federal indictments. Then, 
two FBI officers with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force entered the picture. Dirty agents willing to fix cases and identify informants. Suddenly, two of Rossini's associates, confidential informants working with federal law enforcement, were murdered. Everyone pointed to Rossini. As his co-defendants prepared for trial, U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller sat down to debrief Rossini at Leavenworth Penitentiary, and another story emerged. A tale of FBI corruption and complicity in murder. You see, Pierre Rossini knew something that no one else knew. The truth. And Robert Mueller and the federal government have been covering it up to this very day. Devil Exposed. A twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels. Available on Amazon and Audible. So there's, it's funny. There's a lot of good guys in there. I, actually, there's a lot of good guys that, but it's seriously, there are a lot of good guys, but there's a lot of people that you're just like, wow, like it bothers me that you're going to get out of here at some point. <laughs> oh, dude, there was, there was this guy that I remember I was at, you know, I was bored when I was in there. You know, once I got the good lawyer and things started going right, there was this dude who said to me, uh, that he had been arrested 37 times or, 40, or 67, I don't know what it was. And I was like, dude, after the first few times, you didn't get the hint that you're not good at it. You know, and I'm like, you're stupid, damn. And I figured I should probably be giving advice in jail. So no, I stopped that. <laughs> um, what do you do now? You don't want to know. Do you want to know? <laughs> do you still paint? What? I do high end estates for the one percent. <laughs> Listen, I mean, like this this documentary might not be good for you for your your career. Well, that's the thing is the documentary is supposed to take a retirement road. You know what I'm saying? Right. I wanna I wanna confess. I wanna give you the names you want, right? You want the names of the people that are missing, right? Right. That's what you want. So that's what I want to give you. So the documentary has to leave me employment free. You know, I spilled it all out. Like literally, if you watch this documentary and you say to me, I'm lying to you, an FBI uh, informant that's sitting next to you could ask him. He'll tell you that I'm telling the truth. Everything well, in the documentary is 100 percent true. How long is how long is the documentary? Uh, approximately an hour. Okay. Where are you living now? Uh, undisclosed location. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Dude, if I give you that, man, the people are going to start looking for me, man. <laughs> um, okay. There's not a lot you can answer. Um, where, hey, so where, where is the documentary going to be? It, it's, is it, is it, um, where is it being shown? We are doing a private screening for the media and the critics, right? Like yourself, right? In Fort Lauderdale, Florida, on April thirtieth, and hopefully, once we find a platform that we're going to stream it on, then we'll be able to let you know about that. And the name right. of the mo the movie, the documentary is called "The Picasso of Thieves." And um, I tell you, when you watch the movie, it's you can't. It's this is not acting. I'm not an actor. Right. You know, this is me spilling myself out, you know, and sometimes I think it might be for the adrenaline, but I'm retired now, so I don't have many forms of adrenaline anymore. You know, I got my two daughters, and when they come over, we go roller skating or the Barnes and Noble. So for a retired RC, you might as well just throw me back on Rikers, you know. So <laughs> it's like, you know, when I got in, you know, a lot of people make a big mistake, right? They go into jail and they get sad and they cry and they, I don't know what they do. When I went in, I'm confrontational. You know what I'm saying? If I had a bit, try to stop me. I dare you to try to stop me from getting that phone at the end of the night when that, you tell me that that phone belongs to somebody or it belongs to this bird, the, the red, the blood, the crypts or whatever. I dare you to try to stop me to take that phone. I'll crack you over there with that phone. I'll bust your ass because I'll, I want to feel better. You know, I don't want to be agitated like this guy bitched me out. You know what I'm saying? I'm always about that confrontation. This is all about adrenaline. That the feeling of painting is the same thing as 
you confronting this six foot two dude with fucking muscles. It's all the same shit. Are you doing yes, any more interviews? Have, I have another one on Thursday at five. But check this out, right? I want to give you this. There was this woman. She lived across the street from the from MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan. We were doing a six month job. For her. We were completely done with the job. We had taken the paintings off. We had put them away, brought them back, and we were already done. There was not even a paintbrush inside the apartment. And she, she sees me carrying the painting to give it to her because she's going to hang it. And she looks at me and she says, please be careful. You have no idea what that thing cost. But she didn't realize that that thing was a fake. I already had replaced it. So I knew not only what it cost, because you see, there's two costs. There's the cost that you inflated for the insurance company, and there's the actual cost. Now, either way, I wasn't going to sell it, so it didn't matter. But I can tell you the actual cost. And now, you know, some people, you know, you got to dumb it down sometimes, you know, to make them feel comfortable about themselves and rich people. They're a lot like that. So I, okay. I'm, I'm keep going back to, were you an art? Like, how are you replaced? How are you duplicating these paintings? Uh, my best, you remember Kinko's? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My best thing. And my easiest thing was always to duplicate it on a color copier, high digital, but then add layers to it, whether it be layers of latex paint or the bristles onto it. That was always the easiest. It was like painting by numbers. You know, it wasn't that complicated. And I already knew how to full finish. I knew how to do gold leafing and uh, marmarino and all these other fine finishes. And uh, at that point, you combine the two and it, it wasn't that complicated. And for these people, these aren't, these aren't poor people like your everyday 99% of the country. We're talking about the 1%. That 1% on the top of the food chain, that they're never going to miss that painting. They didn't buy it for an investment, and it's in the basement. And when they do find it, they'll put it back on the wall. Then I'm going to know it's not there, you know. And there's no, no, you know, if you go to a museum, there's people like myself. I go to a museum, and I scrutinize pictures. I go to a museum close by and I'll look at the fibers and I'll look at the layers of paint and the gold leaf and I'll scrutinize every little thing. I could tell you if it's fake or not. There's uh, professionals that go into every museum. The pieces I took, nobody was going to see them except for the owner and his friends. Right. You know, and he's going to walk by it. Bob. He's walking yeah. by it. It's 15 feet away. He glances over. He keeps walking. He's not scrutinizing the painting. Not at all. He's not even looking at the fibers or anything. Dude, I would down to the micrometer on the fibers of the of the brushes. I used to keep a million different uh, paint brushes and I uh, had a, a micrometer and I used to measure the original fiber in the painting because there's always brush hairs inside the latex of the oil paint. I used to make, put them right back where they came from, but it would be on a Kinko's copy. You know, and literally, right. if you look at it, you can tell. What is, <laughs> this is, I was going to say, what is Kinko's now? It's now what, the, uh, um, UPS or FedEx? FedEx store? I think who, it is. I think FedEx Yeah, I think now. it is FedEx store. Yeah, I think it is. You can't do that nowadays, though, because now you got cameras in there, and they won't let you put no masterpiece on no printer. <laughs> <laughs> I got free commentary because I was in the newspaper every day. So out of respect, it made to bring me commissary. I had no commissary. I didn't have shit. I used to give it away because I was too stressed out. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm always burning the candle, you know? So did you get out on bond at any point? No, my bond, my uh, bail was set at $1.5 million. Yeah, there was no getting out. They didn't want to let me out. There was nothing going to happen. And especially yeah, I, my, I, my lawyer was in the newspaper every day. Every single day, he was, my, the DA committed a class D felony with some shit, and they came out in the newspaper, and then every day that my lawyer was antagonizing them, 
So they didn't want to let me out. They were going to torture me until they said, you know what? We've had it. Let him out. If he takes pleads guilty now, they said, if you, if you plead guilty now, you walk out today. I said, yeah, let's do this. And I pled guilty and I walked out. Right. And that was how long after how long? 18 months, 18 months, mm-hmm. which was nothing. It was nothing. I mean, come on, you were in for 13 years. Jesus. Yeah. And you never, you know, you said you never went to a prison. You did this in the county jail, right? Yeah, I did that in Rikers Island and Nassau County. And I actually, they transferred me from Rikers to Nassau County. And I begged my lawyer to trans- have them transfer me back because Rikers Island is like a tropical paradise compared to Nassau County. You know, at Rikers Island, you get Benadryls if you want to go to sleep, you want to smoke weed, whatever you want to do, you can make it happen. But at Nassau County, forget about it. It was like uh, the third right there. It was <laughs> at 6 a.m., I think it was 5 a.m., they slammed the metal doors to wake you up to let you know you're in jail. You know, mm. <laughs> <It's torture. laughs> Yeah, county jails are, are the worst. Like, I, 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 the whole time I was locked up in the county jail or the U.S. Marshals holdover, because I was in a, a federal prison, but you're still being held in a county jail. You know, you're in the, you're in the U.S. Marshals holdover. Well, it's a county jail. So, but the whole time you're there, I remember all the guys kept saying, man, I can't wait to get sentenced and go to jail, go to prison. I can't wait to go to prison. I was like, is prison better than this? And they were like, oh, prison's way better than this. You can, I heard you know, that through. Yeah, and and so and it's just true. Like as soon as I went to prison, I was like, "Oh wow, this is like you could go work work out, you can get a job, you can take classes, you can move around. Like the everything's nicer. You you could actually like start like a little life, not a great life, but a start at least have a like a life. You know, uh, people aren't coming and going. You can you can hang out with people, have regular friends." watch movies, get ice cream at the commissary. Like you could do some stuff. Yeah. Couldn't do that. <laughs> that wasn't uh, happen. No, no. <laughs> rather do two years. I think I'd, rather, <laughs> I'd rather do two years in the federal prison than one year in the County. Dude, when I was in Rikers, when I used to get bored and I wanted to take a field trip, I used to request to go to the DA's office. So I would waste the whole day going to the DA's office to say nothing. <laughs> It was just a good time. You know, I got to see Brooklyn, you know, on the bus, you know, talk to friends. Dude, if they saw me in the hallway, they'd be like, yo, Picasso, what's up? <laughs> I, I had a Sally that said, that asked, said he wanted to talk to the U.S. attorney. said, you know what? I'm going to talk to the U.S. attorney. They brought him the U.S. attorneys, said, listen, I'm starving. Can you all get me something? You know, well, I, and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they said, "What do you want?" Yeah, you know, wants like you know, two uh, two McDonald's hamburgers and a and a uh, some fries. And they're like, "Yeah, no problem." So they go and they get it and they come. And he sits down and he eats the fries and everything <laughs> and eats the hamburgers and sits there for a minute. And he goes, "I just don't feel right about this. I need to go back. Can I go back to the prison?" They were like, "Oh no, no," or go back to the jail. They said, "Listen, you're never coming back here again." You understand? If you think you're fucking around, he's like, yeah, I know. I was never coming back to begin with. And I, I can't stand the food that I know it's a fucked up thing. And they're like, okay, that you're playing. He said in the end, he said it cost me like six extra months. Those two hamburgers cost him like six more months. Because they, they wouldn't give a deal. They wouldn't do anything. Dude, that is some cold, hard stuff there. I mean, you know, he thought people think they, they think it's being cute. They don't think it's cute. The, the crazy thing is that you know, we write our own ticket. You know, I, I've always known, like, literally, since I was a little kid, you know, I've always lived life looking over my shoulder for police, for another bad person. You know, you always, if you if you, if you take that ride, you write the ticket. So when I wrote that ticket and I got arrested, I expected what I expected. I wasn't, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that my girl was pregnant, that was the only missing factor. You know, that factor was Something you know you don't play into when you commit crimes. It's like right now, I have two daughters. I couldn't imagine being away from them for half a second. You know, right. so I couldn't do any of that anymore. You know, I'm retired. I'm done. I'm cooked. Is there like an official um, website or a link you want to give me uh, to put yeah. in the description? Picasso, born in Brooklyn, on Facebook is the main page. But okay. you could also find me under Picasso Vega on Facebook and on LinkedIn. 
But what I would also tell you that the film was actually filmed in Brooklyn. We uh keeping to I mean the original title was gonna be Picasso Born in Brooklyn because you know, the Daily News gave me the name Picasso. You know, I didn't make it up. It wasn't delusional. I made the front cover of the Daily News with the name Picasso over my head. It wasn't a flattering Picasso. And I only tell you this, I only say it once. It was pick. It said Picasso as a whole word, but pick was white. Also was black. Got it? Yeah. Picasso. So I kept it because I'm from Brooklyn and I'm like that. You know, who else makes the front cover of the New Yorker magazine? Come on. The Wall Street Journal? What? Are you crazy? Come on. I'm an art thief. I'm not God. I'm not Bill Gates. And I'm in the Wall Street Journal. I think they featured me like 10 times. Like, you're like, what did I do? Did I kill somebody? I don't know. Well, it's a sensational crime. They love sensational. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) They love sensational. They love unique. Like, you know, if it's Mm -hmm. like, hey, hey, he's a crack dealer. Okay, well, there's thousands of them. Like, that's not, that's nothing special about that. But to be an art thief, that's extremely unique. You know, like, who does that? That's insane. Like, you didn't meet, I guarantee you, the whole time you were locked up, you didn't meet anybody else with your charge. There was another Picasso in there. No. <laughs> yeah. There wasn't another guy stealing artwork. They might have called him Picasso. <laughs> no, there was nobody like that. <laughs> Dude, I tell you that, that, you know, when I went in there and there's so much media on the news every day in the, in the right to value you saw it, I thought I killed somebody by mistake or something. Like, dude, if you look at the, at one of the broadcasts, there's like 30 detectives behind this big platform, behind a microphone, and it's like, we got them. It's like, what? <laughs> Where's the body? <laughs> I don't get it. Well, you know, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Well, you got a document. I don't have a documentary. <laughs> I mean, um, so somebody yeah. thinks it's a big deal. Um, I hope you think it's a big deal, brother, because when you come see the movie, dude, um, I mean, it, 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 the, the movie begins at the age of six. You know, that was when the monster was created. That's when I had a, uh, I saw the world just a little bit differently. Right. You know, you see as a, as a kid, you see the world just a little askew. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, I feel blessed. Like, literally, I feel blessed for everything. When I was in Rikers, I felt blessed. You know, I felt like even though I was in there, dude, I had the best lawyer. Bruce Cutler's law firm representing me. I was in the newspaper every day. The guards knew who I was. Everybody knew who I was. Like, all of a sudden, it was like going into Cheers. And they'd say Norm. But Norm. Instead, they were like, Picasso. <laughs> I was like, yo, I'm right here. <laughs> You said you had not seen the trailer. Is there a trailer? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I, I was felt say, like there was supposed to be a trailer. but not I was going to say it'd be nice if but there was a trailer. Were, we could throw it in here. Well, I was about to say that more than likely when we find a platform that they're going to stream it on, then the platform will cut the trailer for that. Yeah. Well, or they'll ask ask the director or the the they'll ask your yeah. editor, your director, to, hey, can you guys do a 30-second trailer? All right, well, cool. And it's supposed to be animated. It's supposed to have specific songs in there from an artist called C. Slim. Um, I mean, it's supposed to be this, and it's shot in 4K. There's not many documentaries out there shot in 4K where you're going to get that nice, crisp and what, motion. What, what do you mean it's supposed to be? You, haven't you seen it? No. You see, this, <laughs> no, this is not like that. This is not like that. You see, for you to get the full picture of anything, you have to have different eyes on a product. All right. Right. Now this is how I, this is how I ensure the product is going to be put out properly. When when I came up with the thought about putting this picture together, I drove down to Florida to meet Adrian Mazone of Trans Media. You see, if I see you eye to eye, right now, even though we're on the podcast. You know, if I saw you eye to eye, I'd know if you're lying to me. I know if you're full of shit. I'd read you straight through. I met up with uh, Adrian Mazzone. I met up with uh, Carlos Cespedes and Anna Cespedes. I brought my daughters up there so we could all meet. We had a face-to-face conversation. 
I had already verified these people through my own sources. So I knew I was on a positive road. I made it very clear to them. This is, an, uh, this is not a road to redemption video. That's not what this is. Right. I mean, if you want that, you better go watch uh, Charlie Brown or something because that's not what this is. This is, you know, I was an art thief and I'm retired now because my daughter's and I don't want to go to jail. Baby. That's what this is. They would say I was happy as an art thief. You know, right. it's something that brings me pleasure. You know, if, if you go to a museum with me, Matthew, you'll experience art in a different way. It does. It, art is not just that painting that you put on the wall. That's not what art is. Art is meant to be taken in, in so many different means. You know what I'm saying? It's just not just, oh, look at you let go. You know, that's not what the art is. Art has life to it, you know? You feel me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you haven't seen the film? Nope. I mean, are you, have you seen pieces? I made the film, so I, I know exactly what's in the film. Well, you were you know filmed. What I'm you were in front of the yeah. camera. Yeah. But you don't know what they... What what, what, tons of stuff doesn't make the cut. No, I know, but there's nothing that bad. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm an art thief. What's worse than that? <laughs> and there's a lot worse than that. A lot worse than that. But No, I just mean in the general sense of a movie. What are they going to get wrong? Oh, yeah. he was an art thief that liked Salvation Army pictures. Uh, <laughs> I wanted different eyes. And I also wanted a woman's perspective, which is why Anna, uh, Anna Cepeda, uh, she's one of the executive producers and directed the film. Um, I didn't want my, this is not an ego trip for me. This is not, you know, if you think I'm a scumbag, say I'm a scumbag, but this is not an ego trip for me. This is a, you know, I'm, I'm fucked up and I know it. Right. What do you want me to do about it? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Who are you talking <laughs> to? <laughs> Bro, you know I mean? like I was, listen, I was, I was on the run for three years, for four or five years before that. I was running scams. I was making fake people, stealing identities. <laughs> You know, I mean, I've been caught in the bank by police, uh, handcuffed, talked out my way out of, convinced them I hadn't done anything wrong. They had the wrong person. They let me go. Uh, chased by the U.S. Marshals. I mean, I, I, you know, I trust me, I've done all kinds of stuff. It's it's insane. So, I mean, I know what you're saying. Like, I, that's why I'm like, yeah, this is what I did. It's what it is. Like, you get to a point where it's like denying it's it's just there's, just there's no point in it so you might as well lean into it so i know what you're saying it's like i'm not going to deny it so i might as well just tell you everything i might as well just this is what happened like don't hold back there's no reason to hold back at this point there, there's too many articles about me there's too much stuff out there so you can't hide from it so you might as well lean into it so i i so everything you're saying makes sense to me dude and the thing is you know I don't see this as redemption, but the monster that I am, the monster that I feel I am, when I look in the mirror, I see a fucking, I see a monster. That's what I see. I know what I did. Nobody else knows what I did, you know? And uh, I could continue my life doing what I'm doing, or I could be there for my girls and change their lives. And we, you know, I, I take them to the, to the museum and I, teach them about art and we spend a lot of time together. We do a lot of stuff together. They're my therapy. They're my, my everything. I could, like I said, I can't imagine the day without them. They, they, they the way the sun rises and the sun sets is my girls. I, I, when they sleep, I watch them because they're a thing of beauty that you, I, don't, I only get them on the weekend. So I have a very limited span of time that I could, you know, put memories in their head of me, you know, this movie is everything, start to finish. So are are they going to go to the premiere too? No, they're not going to go to the premiere because I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there's an FBI agent going to be sitting next to you, Matthew Cox. <laughs> <laughs> I should say the movie's real. The movie ain't no bullshit. Right. You know, we're talking about this. the FBI has a whole division. FBI has a whole division for art theft. Why wouldn't you send your top guy over there? 
what what I <laughs> um, what's the statute of limitations on art theft? I don't think there's a statute of limitations on art theft. There's got to be. But you got to prove it. No, why? Why yeah, would well, there be a I mean, because what, this two- uh, means yeah, if they find the two paint, if I after a certain amount of years, if they if I find the two paintings that they say I stole, even though I didn't, if they, they can, if I they find them, they can't charge you with them. Oh, yeah, because of the uh, catch That's 22 or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess. Now, they're not going to say they're yours. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> oh, no. You're taking them back. We're just not going to charge you with them. I ain't giving them back. No. I, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. The only hey, thing that doesn't have a statute of limitations mm-hmm. uh, is murder and espionage. Ooh. Yeah, right, so everything else that. has one. It may be 20 years, but there's a statute yeah. of limitations to pretty much everything, yeah. Um, but I would always think, I mean, it would be a smart thing if you know that there's a movie about our theft and you want your law enforcement to become educated. <laughs> I would think Let me tell you something, Matthew. No. Let me tell you something. When they got to my house in Easton, there was a Monet hanging in the toilet. And they walked right by it. And I was like, huh, that's peculiar. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know what? Have you ever seen the movie The Good Thief? No. No, that's with um, Adrian Brody? No. No, no. It's got Nick Nolte is in it. No, I got to watch that. Bro, it, like, it, it, if, you, if you can watch it, like if you can find it and, and watch it, you, you, you should watch it. It's... It's good. Um, it, it's about a con man, and he has a Picasso. Like he he won it fr- he won it from Picasso, but it's not a real Picasso. Like he's got everybody believing it's a real Picasso. He borrows like a million dollars on the painting. He's had it sitting in his house for like twenty years. Everybody's heard the story. Every and then so he when he finally needs some money, he borrows against the Picasso, and it turns out. And of course, it's it's not. It's a fake. And it's a whole scam. The whole movie is just this one scam after another. It's a great movie. But wait, there's a new movie that just came out too uh, about an art thief that gets locked in an apartment. It just came out, but it's in a limited release on AMC, AMC theaters. I was going to go check it out, but uh, I didn't get a chance because I was too busy watching uh, Super Mario Brothers with the girls. Wow. <laughs> Um, that's that's a life change. Oh, William Defoe. William Defoe is in it. He's an art thief that gets locked in an apartment. William Defoe was great in uh, To Live and Die in L.A. when he was uh, he's a, a counterfeiter. That's a oh, good movie. Not... Are you kidding me? Watch. It's, it's, it's a Live and Die in L.A. It's one of these a great movie. Um, he's a counterfeiter. You'd like that one. He's an artist, brother. That's after it. you watch the show, after you watch the movie, I want you to have me back on the show and tell me what you think honestly. Don't don't. Yeah. Don't pull punches. Just be honest. You know, make believe we're in jail. I am. I am <laughs> in shock that you haven't seen this thing. Like, I definitely want to talk. Like, right after. Why? What do you expect? What do you expect? I mean, gonna, they I, can't I, make me look bad. Right? No, it's not that. It's that I think you're all. You're always shocked at what they cut. Like you. You know, typically you see these things. You're like, I can't believe they didn't say this or they said that or. I mean, they I, they took this and that it's out of context. I didn't mean it th- that way, and you know, but but I think you you sound like you're a lot like me, where it's like I feel like I'm okay with what like if as long as it's true, I'm okay with it. If it makes me look bad, I'm okay with it as long as it's what I did. Like you know, don't say that I you know I did this when I didn't when what I actually did was bad enough. Mm-hmm. You know, say what I did. I'm okay. I'll own up to what I did, but I'm not going to start. I'm not going to don't, don't make it look like I did this over here. Cause I didn't. So I think you're the same way. I just, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. I, I also think that we don't always see ourselves the way we truly are. And oh, some dude, you hit the nail on the head, bro. <laughs> yeah, so, so sometimes you'll see stuff and you're like, wow, is that really how people see me? Like, like, but you have to be okay with that. You know, because like I would say, listen, like, you know, if if 20 people say you're an asshole, you're probably an asshole. You may not see it, but 
they're not all wrong. There's 20 people will say that you're an asshole. So, but I'm okay with that. And you seem like you're the same way. So, yeah. Dude, let me tell you, this is a, a true story. My son, um, I have a son, his name is Bobby, and he's uh, 30 years old, and he's grown. But uh, when he was young, I was a young father, and I didn't have a father, so I didn't know what it was like to be a father. You know, I didn't have vices, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't do weed, none of that stuff. So I was full-blown anxiety, rage, all boiling together. I used to I used to call him names. He was overweight. I used to, you know, agitate the situation. And my son doesn't talk to me. You know, I reached out to my son and my son, you know, there's no communication. And it's because I was an asshole. You took the words out of my mouth, you know, and I know I'm an asshole. When I look in the mirror, I know what I did to him. I can't forget about it because I, I see it. I feel it. You know, I was there. You know, you accept it. And then you know what? You 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 just see it every day. You, you don't move on from it because I don't know how people say, oh, you know, let's stop beating yourself up on about it because you can never stop beating yourself. You did it. You know what I'm saying? You hurt somebody's feelings and now he doesn't want to talk to me. And I okay. still love him. He knows I love him, you know, but I was an asshole. So that's the price I'm paying. My son doesn't talk to me either. You know, he's like 20, 20, 23 years old. He doesn't talk to me. He doesn't talk to me because obviously I, when he was three, I went on the run. I get picked up three, four years later. All he knows about me is my dad's a bad person. So by the time I'm in, you know, he could have come to see me. You know, it's too late. By that point, it's, he's seven, eight years old. He's formed an opinion. I'm a bad person. He didn't want anything to do with me. My ex-wife didn't help me out any. And by the time she realizes, okay, he's getting out soon, the kid's like 18, 19 years old, and she's saying, hey, you should go see your father in prison. You should build a relationship. And he's like, fuck that, dude. I'm done with that guy. I'm not fucking with him. He's a piece of shit. You know? And the problem is he's got a powerful argument. It's not like I can say, no, no, you're wrong. No, no, you you hit it on the head. Um, you know, but... So, uh, you know, and I've done the same thing. I've reached out to him. I text him. You know, we go back and forth a little bit. It's he says horrible, mean, angry things to me. You know, so I'm the same thing. And I, I feel like the same way. Like, it's like I've done everything I should I can think to do. But it's always on my mind, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, it never goes failure. away. My yeah. And my failure, you know, you. <laughs> I mean, they're men now, you know what I'm saying? He, your son's 23, mine's 30 years old, he's married, he's got a house, cars, you know, and I failed him. And I was supposed to be that person that didn't fail him. You right. Know? And the, the worst part is guys like you and I, we keep it in our minds so we don't do it again. Or so we always, it's, it's a punishment. It's a self-torture. Right. There's other people that forgive and forget and let's just move on and blame it on the kid and blame it on everyone. But don't take the don't look in the mirror and don't blame it on yourself because that's the true person who caused all the damage. Oh, I'm I'm always in shock at guys that I know that have just been brutal, horrible to, to, to their children. Their children show up for prison, they're there every visit, they love them, they and it's like Wow, like you you were brutal to your kid. You were horrible to him. You were horrible to his mother, to the, you know, and they show up. They, they, I'm they about that too. Yeah. Cause I always feel like, you know, like when I was there, I was good. I just disappeared. This is a horrible conversation. Let's end this. No, it's actually not a horrible conversation because it's a learning point, you know? And that's the whole point, though. That's the whole point of the movie. You know, it's like, uh, I got fucked up at six years old. You know, are you mad at me? Because at six years old, I saw some shit that I shouldn't have seen and I became fucked up. I mean, I don't, I see life as normal for me, you know, and just so you know, this movie has already cost me one job <laughs> because I was talking to a coworker. You see, I'm real. I told the coworker, look, I'm making a movie. And this bastard went to the, to the boss and ratted me out. <laughs> <laughs> I expect when this, if this hits big, that, you know, I expect to get fired. So, right. you know, every, we write our own check. This check is written. 
But right. if this hits big and I get fired, that means I made it big, right? So then who gives a shit? <laughs> yeah. It's a problem you should be able to handle at that point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, damn. You know, I've had worse, you know. I just want to be able to, you know what? I would like to be able to do something that I like to do and be able to spend as much time with my girls till, you know, you bury me in the backyard or something. Oh, and Noah Noah Charney is in the movie. I know he's not on this poster because this poster is uh, one of the first ones. But Noah Charney is an author, and he writes a lot of books on art and theft of art. So uh, he's in the movie. He makes a special appearance, which I'm so excited about. So please check him out. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the video. Do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Uh, hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Um, also, I'm going to leave all of Picasso's social media links are going to be in the description. Uh, I'm going to try and figure out if we can get some kind of a link to the official movie, either the trailer or to the website uh, for or, or some type of a link. And uh, I appreciate you guys watching. I also, when I was locked up, I wrote a whole bunch of true crime books. So check out the trailers. And, and all right, see ya.